Hey Internet, we have got an absolutely phenomenal text lined up this week from the lectionary. It's something we've been working towards for a long time and I'm very excited to get into it. But first, in order to bring about the fullness of the meaning of this text and where it fits into the Gospel of Luke, we need a little bit of review. First, we need to understand that in Luke there is a major discourse that has been taking place from chapter 15 until chapter 18 where we are right now. By discourse, I mean a section in which Jesus is talking and doing teaching. It's not merely describing who he is and what he's doing, but what he's saying. This discourse all begins at the start of chapter 15 when the Pharisees, who are the good people of the day, the people you would want to be your friends, the people you would think of as spiritual, not religious. No, really. They get upset because the not-so-spiritual people are drawing near to Jesus and Jesus is accepting them. Namely, tax collectors. Tax collectors were seen as heretics and as traitors to the Jewish faith because they had to accept another king, not a son of David, but Caesar. So the tax collectors and sinners are drawing near to Jesus, and the Pharisees don't like it. Jesus begins this chapter 15 discourse that runs all the way through until the end of chapter 18. Everything that's going on is really Jesus pointing out again and again that man wants to justify himself, but cannot justify himself because he is without faith and a sinner, leading up to this text to day. But this text is not the end. This text is the absolutely, hey, here it is, here's the idea, but he's not going to stop. The discourse goes on just a little bit more, because after the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, you have a one-two punch of, let the little children come to me, go away, rich young ruler, sad and unable to justify yourself, and oh, by the way, so you can uppercut, the Son of Man has to suffer and die for all of you. <laughs> but, we're not going to be able to do all that today. This week's text only is the Pharisee and the tax collector and the little children, which needs the rest, but that's okay. That's what we got. Key to understanding right off the bat the meaning of the text, the reason Jesus is telling it is to understand who he's telling it to. Chapter 18, verse 9. He told also this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. But key there, again, is this word righteous. Dikaios. This is the justification word. Wherever you come across it in scripture, it doesn't just mean justice. It doesn't just mean good. It's tied up in the reality of what it means to stand before a holy God and not be burned to a crisp because you are in opposition and enmity with him. Well, there are some who are trusting that in themselves they have the ability to stand in front of this holy God and not be burned to a crisp because they're not in enmity with him because of who they think they are and what they have achieved, namely, dikaios, goodness, righteousness in themselves, self-justification. And as a result of this oh-so-pious humility, they tend to look down on those who are not as good as they are. Oh Lord, we just praise you because you've been so good to us, and we just give you thanks because you've been so wonderful, and our lives have been truly blessed by you, and so we magnify your name for all the glory that you give. It's all about me. It is all about you. Now the greatest collection of me worship ever assembled on one CD. It's all about now I lift my name on high. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. I me. He's our hero. Yay! And one was a tax collector. And the Pharisee, standing apart by himself, prayed thus. And I am why I sing, and I am why I live. God, I thank you that I am not like the others. Patience, the unjustified, the sexually immoral. I'm so good and holy. I've left my sin behind. I praise you. I magnify you. I lift up my eyes to you. And I say thank you for me. I fast twice a week. And I tithe. You promise that if we just give a portion of our tithe, you will open the floodgates. And I do. And you've blessed me. <laughs> I'm trying not to be mean. Um...
<laughs> know what though? I am so very glad that I'm not like people who have theology like that. <laughs> tax collector standing far off at the back would not even lift his eyes to heaven. He was not worthy to look forward. Not as an act of piety, not as an act of devotion, but as one who believed the next words he said. God be merciful to me, a sinner. And key here is to understand this word mercy. I love the word mercy and the prayer Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy, and the good diaconal, deacon mercy works of the church, but none of those words are this word here. This word here is elaskamai. And it's not just mercy as in be nice or do good or help. It means atone, expiate, propitiate, make up the difference for, by blood sacrifice, dare I say it, justify me, a sinner. I tell you, Jesus said, this man, this sinner, went down to his home. Dedekai ominous, perfect, passive, participle, having been and remaining justified, innocent, saved, and not the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humiliated. But the one who is humiliated, who humiliates himself, who confesses his sin, he will be exalted, lifted up, dare I say it, raised from the dead. I know some of you who are out there watching this show are probably people who like your praise music and I don't want to get in your ear too hard about whether or not you like guitar or whether or not you like the organ. And dare I say it to the world, organ's not my favorite instrument. But at this point in time in our cultural context, I will take organ-based liturgy any day of the week over what we call praise and worship. It's all about me. And now I lift my name on high. Because the songs of praise and worship, if you look at the words and the direction, are the prayer of the Pharisee. Now, to be sure, you can find a song here and a song there that's not. That's not the point. The point is, what are you doing for the whole course of your worship? The strength of the Lutheran liturgy, quite apart from whatever instrument you use to accompany it, the Western Catholic rite of word and sacrament within the context of confession and forgiveness to strengthen faith in the resurrected Savior who atoned for your sin to justify you, that liturgy is the liturgy of the tax collector. It's not really any getting around it. Now, the last thing I want to do is have you complaining, Oh, what do you got against guitar? I'm not talking about music. Don't hear that. I'm not talking about music. I'm talking about the words you sing, the words you pray. Because what? Worship's what you receive. Right? Speaking of which, the next verse says, They were bringing infants to Jesus so that he might touch them. The Greek word is brephes, and yes, it means infants. Biggest babies you can get, babified to the baby max. And they were carrying them in their arms to Jesus, so that he might put himself upon them. This sounds an awful lot like something. <laughs> baptism? Now, no, it's not baptism in the text, but it certainly carries with it connotations and implications for what baptismal theology means. Namely, that Jesus is capable of blessing everyone. But see, there's some believers that just don't like this because really it strikes at the core of self-justification. When the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. I mean, think about it. Every time somebody argues against infant baptism, the first thing they're going to say is what? But the baby doesn't get to make the choice themselves. How can you bring them when the baby's not able to? Self-justification. It's the only reason to oppose infant baptism. So don't tell me you believe in salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, if you're going to make your defense against infant baptism based upon the need of the baby to do something. Because Jesus says, let the children come to me. And a key shift in the language here, children, now paidos, a word that can convey anybody who's not been, say, bar mitzvahed, anyone who's not progressed into adulthood, from the infant to the 13-year-old. And when they say, don't let the babies come, he says, bring the children, they're all of one kind. And by the way, that one kind is the one you have to become, for to such belong the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive, receive, receive the kingdom of God, like a child, Pida, shall not enter it. Worship is what you receive. Christianity is what you receive. Jesus is what you receive.
This is not just about infant baptism. This is about salvation, period. It's not about you. The only thing you bring to salvation, the only thing you bring to justification, by goodness, the only thing you bring to sanctification is your sin. It requires the Christ to make blood atonement for you to receive. And thus the prayer of the church is, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And his answer, his promise, his gospel is always, I do. Now back on our map, the next piece here, Pharisee, tax collector, babies, good young man. They line up like that, and while the babies are brought, the good young man is going to go away because he would justify himself. Don't tell me there's not a theme, content, and a structure to this entire thing. It's beautiful, leading towards the answer of justification for you. The Son of Man must go to the cross, be betrayed, die, rise again. It's great stuff. It'll preach, let me tell you. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, it just did. So you can tell me what I've done. The door is closed, so all your eyes. But now I see the sun. Now I see the sun. Yes, now I see it.